the most important trait in life is courage because fearlessness is just jumping off the cliff and not thinking about the consequences. But courage is acknowledging your fears, analyzing the consequences, and deciding you still care so much that you're going to take one thoughtful step forward anyway. I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. Alex Benayan is on the show today. At age 18, the day before his freshman year final exams, He hacked the prices right, won a sailboat, sold it, and used the prize money to fund his quest to learn from the world's most successful people. He was on a mission to uncover how they broke through and launched their careers. Alex went on a seven-year journey tracking down people like Bill Gates, Maya Angelou, Steve Wozniak, Jessica Alba, and the list goes on and on. He even chased Larry King in a grocery store and snuck into Warren Buffett's shareholders meeting. Alex just released a book that shares all of his lessons. It's called The Third Door. In this discussion with Alex, we talk about what he learned from all these fascinating people. But what I took away is that his story is just as fascinating. And what he has to share is just as valuable as all of these big names that I just listed. Alex has been named to the Forbes 30 Under 30 list and the Business Insider's Most Powerful People Under 30. He's quite the force and he's just getting started. Here's Alex. We tackle the most taboo topics on the Why Not Now show. Oftentimes, you're hearing guests share things they've never shared before. In the spirit of things we don't typically talk about, you should know that the Why Not Now show is supported by Poopery. Yep, the original before you go toilet spray. It's magic. My friends at Poopery have literally taken the smell out of you know what. This pure blend of essential oils stops bathroom odor before it begins. Visit poopery.com and why not now listeners get 20% off with code why not now. That's all one word. Also, you can now get Poopery at Target. Alex, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I am great. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. I am jazzed. I was just telling you earlier before we hit record, I feel like I've been a little bit of a, a stalker and I'm so excited to talk to you. And the homework part is my fa- one of my favorite parts. And the fact that I got to watch your Larry King interview and listen to your Cal Fussman interview, it's just, like it's it's great. And the book is amazing. So let's hop in where we always start. First things first, can you tell me about a time when you had to ask yourself, why not now? And we will dissect that day, that moment, that minute. Oh, yeah. You know, it's so funny. If I close my eyes, I can actually not only visualize where I was sitting, but I can feel the emotion still. To give you the context of how that moment came to be, I have to take you back about seven years. So I'm 18 years old, a freshman in college, and I'm spending every day lying on my dorm room bed, staring up at the ceiling. And to understand why I'm going through this life crisis, you have to understand that I'm the son of Persian Jewish immigrants, which pretty much means I came out of the womb 
my mom cradled me in her arms and then she stamped MD on my ass and sent me on my way. <laughs> Become a doctor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you know, you think it's funny, but in third grade I wore scrubs to school for Halloween and thought oh. I was cool. You know, that was my childhood. And, you know, in high school, I went to pre-med summer camp. So by the time I got to college, I am the pre-med of pre-meds. And this wasn't just, you know, my family's expectations. This was my entire identity. So that's why it was such a shock to me when, you know, just this first month of college, I had expected to be jumping out of bed and so excited to finally be a pre-med But I was hitting snooze like four or five times each morning, not because I was tired, but because I was bored. And I remember lying on my bed, looking over at my desk at this stack, you know, this high stack of biology books, feeling like they were dementors sucking the life out of me. And at first I assumed, you know, I'm just being lazy. But then I began to wonder, maybe I'm not on my path. Maybe I'm on a path somebody placed me on and I'm just rolling down. So now not only do I not know what I want to do with my life, I start wondering how all these people who I looked up to, like, how did they do it? You know, how did Bill Gates, when he was an unknown sophomore in college, sell software out of his dorm room? Or how did Steven Spielberg, when he was rejected from film school, become the youngest studio director in Hollywood history? Like, these are the things they don't normally teach you in school. So... You know, very simply, I just went to the library, assuming there had to be a book with the answers. So I I remember just ripping through, you know, business books and self-help books and biographies, and I'm just, you know, tearing through the pages. But eventually, I was left empty-handed. There wasn't a single book that, you know, included all these industries that I was interested in and focused on this really particular stage in life when no one's answering your calls No one wants to take your meetings. How do you find a way to break through and launch your career? So that's when my naive 18-year-old thinking kicked in, and I thought, well, if no one's going to write the book I'm dreaming of reading, why not write it myself? You know, I thought it would take a couple months. I would just call up Bill Gates, interview him, interview (laughs) everyone else, and I'll be (laughs) done, you know, by the time summer vacation was over. That, I assumed, was the easy part. I'm going to pause you really quickly right here because this is actually one of my questions and then let's pick up right here. So I'm going to bookmark this. So you had so much, it was just matter of fact, you were going to do this over the summer, right? Call up Bill Gates and get these answers. And I have kind of two part question, which you should never do, which I've learned from Cal Fussman. You should always just have one question, but I'm breaking the rules. First of all, it occurred to me, how are you just so confident? Most people would would think there's no way I can get to Bill Gates. Have you always just been a confident person? I mean, you're 18 years old. And then also I learned more and I heard you say when you're beginning at something, you're fueled by possibilities and experts are ruled by limitations. And that really struck me and and we'll get to more of that later but have you just always kind of had the well just I'll just do it myself I'll make it happen I think something I have always had was you know my family jokes that I'm like the you know permanently naive person in the family where I'm like oh of course like why can't we just do this and everybody rolls their eyes and I end up getting myself in a ton of trouble and you know, people have to end up saving my ass. <laughs> or huge opportunities, like when you asked Tony Shea, can I shadow you? And he's like, sure. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's both. But Yeah, and I think the, the beauty of it is, is that in that moment when it came to, you know, that very naive thought of, you know, why don't I just call up Bill Gates? That wasn't the hard part. The hard part is what came a few months later. So, you know, once I, and it wasn't even a decision at that time. It was almost this, like, why not try to do this? It was almost like, you know, let's see where it goes. Love because it. my biggest obstacle was, you know, I can't go and write this book because I'm buried in student loan debt. I'm all out of bar mitzvah cash. Like, how am I going to get money to go travel to Bill Gates? So to me, it wasn't even a matter of whether or not I'll write this book. It was like, let's see if it's even possible. And my limiting factor in my mind was money, not the fact that Bill Gates would say no. (laughs) 
which is another awesome, awesome thing. Okay, so can carry on. I think I think that's just really important because so many times we'll stop ourselves before we've even thought it through or tried. And you seem to be missing that quality in a good way uh, or that defect. And one other thing to point out for listeners is I heard you mention the snooze button. And this has been a theme for some people in my life who have been mentors like Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos, who if you're hitting the snooze button, you might want to check yourself and do a bit of an audit. It's one thing to just be tired, but it's another to be consistently hitting that snooze button. Uh, even if you, it seems like you're in a great spot or you're where you're supposed to be, but it's like a, an awesome you know, alarm that you can kind of be like, wait a minute. Is there some? Is this a like you know yellow flag here? But okay, so you you decide you're going to go do it, right? Sorry to interrupt. I just thought those were important takeaways. I think those are such important lessons, and yeah, you're exactly right. So at this point, I'm deciding. All right, so I don't have the money. How am I going to figure this out? And I keep thinking and I keep thinking. And about two nights before final exams, my freshman year of college, I'm in the library doing what everybody does in the library right before finals I'm on Facebook <laughs> and on Facebook. I see someone offering free tickets to the price is right. And I've of course seen the game show, you know, when I was homesick from school in fourth grade, but I'd never seen a full episode of the show before. Plus I had finals in two days. So, you know, I told myself, you know, don't even think about it. But for some reason, the only thought in my mind was, but what if I go on the show and win some money to fund this dream? You know, not my brightest moment, but I tried to take it out of my mind and focus on studying. But I don't know if you've ever had one of these moments where just the same thought keeps clawing itself back and back into your mind. Mm -hmm. So I remember making a, you know, taking out my spiral notebook. I'm sitting at this, you know, small round wooden table in the corner of the library and I take out my spiral notebook and write best and worst case scenarios to prove to myself it's a bad idea. And I wrote, you know, worst case scenarios, fail finals, get kicked out of pre-med, lose financial aid, mom hates me, no, mom stops talking to me, look fat on TV. You know, there's like 20 <laughs> cons. And the only pro is maybe win enough money to fund this dream. So it felt almost as if somebody was tying a rope around my gut and was slowly pulling in a direction. And I decided to do the logical thing that night and pull an all-nighter to study. But I didn't study for finals. I studied how to hack the prices right. <laughs> so I go on the show the next day and execute this ridiculous strategy and end up winning the whole showcase showdown, winning a sailboat, selling the sailboat, and that's how I funded the book. And didn't you have to wear something funny? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I, anyone who's watched The Prices Right knows you have to be colorfully dressed and have these, you know, wild personalities <laughs> and the whole like hacking the prices right was much less Albert Einstein and more Forrest Gump. The important part of that story is that that's what actually leads me to my why not now moment. Because now I finally, my obstacles cleared. I finally have the money. I sell the sailboat. I have, I think I sold it for, you know, $16,000, which for a college freshman is a million bucks. So in my mind, I have unlimited money and... <laughs> And I have summer vacation coming up. So I have unlimited money, unlimited time. And I'm going to, in my mind, go try to make this dream happen. And then right around then is when I have a very routine meeting with my academic advisor. And my pre-med advisor sits me down and says, Alex, if you don't spend this entire summer in chemistry, taking summer school, you can graduate college on time and go to medical school. And I remember the second she said that, I just blurted out, no. And, you know, I'm not the kind of person who just does that. And she looks at me, taken aback, and I sort of, I'm like, yeah, I'm sorry. I meant, you know, I, I have other plans this summer. And she goes, no, 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 Alex. Pre-meds don't have other plans. You're either on the track or you're not. And essentially, she was giving me this ultimatum between staying pre-med and 
becoming a doctor and working on this dream of mine. And I remember leaving that meeting and dragging my feet back to my dorm room and sitting up at my dorm room desk, you know, this really tiny wooden desk. And it was just so intense, that feeling of, you know, on the one hand, here's my entire identity of being a doctor. And on the other hand is this dream. And it almost felt like my insides were the rope of a tug of war. And these two thoughts kept pulling. Because on the one hand, I really had this dream that if all these people come together, not for press, not to promote anything, but really just to give their best wisdom to the next generation, young people can do so much more. And then on the other hand, pulling the rope was this very clear understanding that, you know, not only is being a doctor what my family expects, they fled Iran during a revolution and sacrificed everything to come to this country and give me an education so I could become a doctor and not have to suffer the way they suffered in their lives. But all I could think was, why not now? And so you have this one side, other side, and it's not just, I mean, the pressure of that heritage and and the legacy and I, I can't even imagine. Was it a quick decision? So you're sitting there with your advisor and 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 then you're you're thinking this through. Would you say it was pretty quick? You know it wasn't. And I think the decisions that change your life are never a hundred percent obvious. If they are, you know, a hundred percent, I think you're not fully thinking it through. Because when you fully weigh a really big decision that's essentially changing the course of your life, there's a lot of variables in the equation. It's funny you say that. It's Ryan Holiday, who's been on the show, has said the very same thing. And I think people need to realize that. Like, it's not just always this duh or in hindsight. It's really, I think, a, a critical point for people to realize. Yeah, I 100, I 100% agree. So for me, it was trying to decide what to do. And, you know, you brought up Tony Shea. One of my favorite things about his book, Delivering Happiness, which I had just read at that time, is there's this line where, you know, Tony Shea is deciding whether he's going to stay and work at Microsoft or if he's going to give up all the money and set off to be on his own. And the line that he says to himself is, because the year at the time I think was 1997 or 1999, and the line he says is, there'll never be another, you know, 1999. And I remember sitting at my desk, you know, in this tug of war between fulfilling my family's dreams versus fulfilling my own. And all I could hear in my head was, you know, there'll never be another 1999. I'll never get this time back. And so you, you know, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and obviously huge decision. And there's a lot riding on this decision and you've got a lot of, a lot of pressure. And ultimately we know what you decided because you're not a doctor right now, as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> and you have this book and it's what, seven, eight years later. Is there anything else you could say about that moment that, might allow us to kind of take a glimpse into exactly how you navigated it. I think one of the hardest parts of decisions like that, especially if you're dealing with whether it's your parents or your spouse or your best friends who are trying to pull you in another direction. The hardest part is actually when you have, you know, really good loving relationships with those people and they've never steered you wrong. That's what actually makes the decision so hard. You know, if I had parents who, you know, were, you know, constantly hurting me or giving me horrible advice, it wouldn't be that hard decision. What made it so difficult is when you have people you love, people you care about, and people who have sacrificed enormously for you to be where you are, 
to go against their wishes and their guidance, that's what makes these decisions so hard. And that's what really makes this a moment of courage where what I've understood about courage is, and in my research the past seven years, whether I'm studying Jeff Bezos or Maya Angelou or Steve Jobs, they all agree that the most important trait in life is courage because, you know, fearlessness is just jumping off the cliff and not thinking about the consequences. You know, that's, in my opinion, idiotic. So fearlessness should never be the goal. But courage is acknowledging your fears, analyzing the consequences, and deciding you still care so much that you're going to take one thoughtful step forward anyway. One step. That's amazing. A few things that you've you've just said so resonate because – First of all, when you went through the worst case scenario pros and cons list before you decided to go on the prices right and pursue this more, that is a theme among the people that I speak with. They do go through that process of logically and analytically, step by step, what is the actual worst case scenario? And it doesn't start there. Usually it's, what if this doesn't work? And then what? And then what? And then what? And 97, then what's later? Usually you're at your worst case. But then also you have this ability, it, it seems, you're, you're such a visionary in a way that, and self-aware that you realized the ladder you were about to climb was against the wrong wall before you even really stepped foot on mm. it. And I speak with so many people who they do move their ladder to another wall, but usually they're near the top or at least halfway up that ladder. I have to point that out because you were 18 years old and you just knew like this isn't, and you had plenty of reasons why you should, and you knew you shouldn't. So it's got to be strong intuition and, and just grab. I appreciate pull. that. And you know, I remember very, I remember the, the clues and they actually seemed not that mysterious to me. I remember sitting in my, you know, with the whole, you know, snooze button, you know, those are important clues, but sometimes you can just say, oh, I'm tired from the night before. Or, oh, I, I'm just going through, you know, a phase where I need a lot of sleep. What, you know, wasn't debatable is I would be sitting in these pre-med classes and all the kids sitting next to me are, you know, taking notes a hundred miles an hour. They're Leaning going to the in. library. They're just, <laughs> yeah, they're ripping through it. And they, you know, whether they're, enjoying it or not, they're like approaching it with this enthusiasm where, you know, I'm sitting in class, sneaking in the four hour work week under my desk, trying to, you know, not let the professor see it. And I'm, I remember at the time, a friend of mine, uh, showed me like this random guy's keynote. His name was Gary Vaynerchuk. And he had just come out with a book and I'm like watching his keynotes like late into the night and I'm just procrastinating all of my biology homework. <laughs> so you were third dooring it before you even invented the third door <laughs> or realized I, yeah, there I wasn't. No, that third was door. even a, a thing. Oh, gosh. So, okay. So let's get to some of the, the gist of the book. I mean, we could talk for hours. You have spoken with the best of the best, the, the top people, highly effective, efficient, wildly successful people in in so many different verticals and industries. You've been able to realize, wow, they all have something in common and it is this third door. So tell us what that means. So after going on this journey the past seven years, you know, when I had started. And by the way, seven years, <laughs> that's amazing. Well, look, if you had told me when I was starting, this is going to take seven years, I'm like, ah, I think I could do something else. And you're only 25 now, right? Which yes, is it's amazing. Been, uh, it's been a, a very solid chunk of my life. And that's sort of the beauty of it too, which is when you don't know how long something will take, but you just love it, you just keep going. And when I had started, I was never looking for the one key to success. You know, we've all seen those TED Talks and business books and, you know, I normally just roll my eyes. But what happened after this, you know, seven year journey of doing all these interviews 
it didn't matter if it was, you know, Bill Gates for business or Maya Angelou for poetry, no matter how different they were on the outside, Gates grew up wealthy in Seattle. Maya Angelou grew up, you know, with not many resources in Stamps, Arkansas. They couldn't have had more different journeys. At their core, they were the exact same. And And how so? You know, the analogy that came to me was that every single one of these people treats life and business and success like a nightclub. And there's always three ways in. There's the first door, the main entrance, where the line curves around the block, where 99% of people, you know, <laughs> when I in go line, home. Just, exactly. <laughs> you know, these people are just waiting in line, hoping to get in. That's 99% of society. And then there's the second door, the VIP entrance, where the billionaires and celebrities slip through. And for some reason, school and society have this way of making us feel like those are the only two ways. in. You're either born into it or you wait your turn like everybody else. But what I've learned is that there's always, always the third door. And it's the entrance where you have to jump out of line, run down the alley, bang on the door a hundred times, crack open the window, go through the kitchen. There's always a way in. And it doesn't matter if that's how Gates sold his first piece of software or how Lady Gaga got her first record deal. They all took the third door. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hi, everyone. If you are digging this podcast, please subscribe, rate and review on iTunes. It just takes a moment and it means a ton to us. Also, after recording more than 100 episodes, I've created a bit of a cheat sheet on the top five things I've learned from renegades and how they get from idea to action, from dreaming to doing. I will email you the downloadable PDF when you subscribe to my newsletter. Just head to amyjoemartin.com and click on connect with me. Did you realize this year four? Did you realize this, you know half a year in. When did you realize the third door was a thing? That's a pretty good guess. Year four is actually like right around well, where it was. I don't know it why. It's a good like, number out of the air. Really well done. <laughs> Interesting. And and this is another point. So you you set out to write this book thinking you knew what you wanted to learn and what it would be about. And along the way, I mean, from a reader's standpoint, I have an opinion that the book has nothing to do with Bill Gates, uh, Jane Goodall, Jessica Alba, Pitbull, Tim Ferriss. It is all about your journey. And we talked about this a little bit before we hopped on and and hit record because it's so important for me to hear right now as I'm writing my second book, thinking it's about what I've learned from all these similar types of people, some of which are on your list too. And so first of all, you you thought you were setting out to do one thing, realized maybe four years in, well, there's a similarity in a theme, which makes sense, but what an amazing, awesome discovery. When did you realize this book was about you? You know, this is sort of how the journey of the book writing process went. The original idea was I was just going to go, you know, interview all these people and each chapter will be a different person. You know, one chapter on Bill Gates, another chapter on Steve Wozniak, and it just would have their words and I would maybe clean it up and edit it. But, you know, in the end, it was just their words. After I ended up getting my publishing deal, I had this amazing editor at my publisher And he called me into his office a year after I got the publishing deal. And I've been working on the book for years at this point. And, you know, he's this big, uh, you know, gruff New York guy. And he calls me into his corner office and he's like, Alex, what's, uh, what's the point of your book? I'm like, what? (laughs) You bought it. And he's like, yeah. (laughs) Don't you know? (laughs) And I'm like, like, I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, is the point of your book to inform people or is it to change their lives? And I'm like, well, that's a pretty leading question. It's, uh, <laughs> I would hope it's to change, change people's lives. And he goes, well, the book you're currently writing is not going to do that. 
And I'm like, what the hell? Like, we've been working together for a year now. Why haven't you said anything? And he goes, oh, I know you. You wouldn't have listened. And <laughs> pretty much what he goes on to tell me is that, you know, we've all read amazing magazine Q&As, but how many of those have ever changed our lives, no matter how brilliant they are? But mm-hmm. if we think about the things in literature that have changed our lives, whether it's, you know, Harry Potter or the Odyssey, you know, they're all at the end of the day, the same story. It's a relatable person in the beginning going through a struggle that everyone can relate to. And something miraculous happens to that person and it sends them on this quest. And as that person fumbles and learns and grows, so does the reader. Hero's journey, right? Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. And I remember my editor telling me this and it's so funny when I think back to it because I remember in his office being like, okay, like who who should it be our main character? Bill <laughs> Gates, Steve Spielberg. He's like, no, you idiot, it's you. <laughs> and it took me months and months to finally come to accepting that because I had spent years, you know, going around telling everyone, you know, this isn't about me. And what my editor helped me realize is that it's still not about me. You know, this isn't my autobiography. All that it is is I'm just a conduit for the reader. So when I'm sitting in Bill Gates' office with sweaty palms and Bill Gates is looking in my eyes and telling me you know, his secrets to negotiating, the reader gets to be in Bill Gates' office too. When Steve Wozniak is cracking open a fortune cookie in a Chinese restaurant talking about you know, his secret to sustainable happiness, the reader is sitting at that table too. And they know and what it took to get there, I think, like exactly. all the trials and That's really the magic. Interesting. Wow, what what insight. And thank goodness your editor, your the publisher, came to you with that. <laughs> I mean, of course there it was going to happen, but they bought it as you sold it. So it's funny about books how you propose something – it gets you get a deal, and then sometimes it's completely different. Many times it's completely different from what you sold. But you're in all these scenarios, Alex, and and you have this moment. If you could walk us through a little bit, one specific moment where well, there are many, but you had tried and tried to communicate with Warren Buffett, and he did respond. And I've heard the same scenario where he'll respond with handwriting sometimes to printed emails that his assistant prints out and scans back in. And this pen pal ship went on, but then you hit a dead end. And then you finally get in front of him. Can you talk a little bit about that? And then that moment that was really dark where you you felt defeated and you ran into someone at Whole Foods. Mm. So what ended up happening, you know, like you said, I, I, I go on this six month quest to try to interview Warren Buffett. And this wasn't like this part time job for me. This was my full time focus. This was the number one thing in my life. I would wake up at 6 a.m. and just read biographies on Buffett, listen to audiobooks about Buffett, watch interviews about Buffett. I would try to learn everything I can about him to make sure my letters as specific and personal as possible. And I wrote letter after letter after letter, handwritten, and I sent it to his office. And like you said, he would handwrite responses back every now and then. And I thought, you know, I was 99% there. So I would just call his assistant week after week after week. You know, by month five, it is getting excessive. And I'm just getting hit with rejection after rejection. And it feels emotionally like he's just punching me in the throat, you know, hitting me with a hook in the gut. My insides are battered. It feels like I'm coughing up blood. And finally, um, towards the end of this six month journey, I'm on the phone, you know, like I am every week with Buffett's assistant. (laughs) And she's like, look, Alex, I know Warren. And I know when he says no, the answer is no. And look, I, I really appreciate, you know, that your heart is in the right place. But, you know, how about this? How about you come as my guest to the Berkshire Hathaway annual shareholders meeting? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God, thank you so much. Um, isn't it true that 
people can ask questions to Mr. Buffett during the Q&A portion of the shareholders meeting. And she's like, Alex, 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 I, I know what you're trying to do, but it's not possible. There's 30,000 people there and only a thousand, you know, there's yeah. 30,000 people there and only 30 get to ask questions. So your odds are one in a thousand and it's a random lottery. So I wouldn't get your hopes up. So you're thinking, you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Remember that Dumb, Dumb and Dumber? dumber line yes. <laughs> my friends, this is, I love that you just said that. That's sort of been the running joke over the past seven years. Every now and then there's this like meme, <laughs> this gif of like that moment in Dumb and Dumber where they're like, so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> where like anytime I would like text my friends, we were on this group text and I would have this idea. They would just respond with that meme. <laughs> That's awesome. Because that's pretty much been like the catchphrase of the past seven years. So you're saying there's a chance. 30 out of 30,000. So you're saying there's a chance. I love it. So and you get there. So we go to Omaha and we get there and the doors to the, you know, the stadium don't open until 7 a.m. But we get there at 4 a.m. We're standing in the blistering cold. And finally, the doors to the stadium open and people are running in and, you know, there's leather briefcases and suits and ties and people are yelling, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me. It's like this business casual running of the bulls. (laughs) And we get in there and I didn't have a plan, but I just assumed, you know, maybe this is like the price is right. Maybe there's a system to it. And we start running around and talking to different people who work the event, asking for advice. And eventually we find a loophole. And it was me and my five best friends who all went together. And although we were told our odds are one in a thousand, out of the six of us, four got winning lottery tickets. And that's how I asked my interview questions to Warren Buffett in front of 30,000 people. (laughs) It's amazing. Amazing. So in the end, you did. And, And your commitment to this is, I think, what as a reader kept to me just, whoa, how many times, you know, the, the different angles and third doors that you found. So there was a moment where you were feeling pretty defeated and you're having a sandwich sitting on, you know, the, oh yeah, (laughs) sitting out front of, of Whole Foods on a sidewalk, talking to your friend And you were just really down on yourself. Things weren't going well. You weren't getting your interviews. And you didn't feel like even when you did, you weren't interviewing well. And then you saw, well, then something happened. Talk us through this because this to me was a, well, I have have more questions, but share first kind of what happened. So, yeah, with Buffett, there was, after the shareholders meeting, this really big revelation that sort of feels like a train crash in my life. And it spits me out. And one of my best friends, his name is Corwin, he sees, you know, how down I've been and how just, you know, completely depressed and out of energy I am. So after two weeks of me sort of sleeping in and sulking, he's like, dude, all right, let's go grab some food. And he tries to give me a pep talk. And, you know, like you said, we're eating these sandwiches. We're sitting on the sidewalk in front of this grocery store. And I'm just doing what I do with my best friends. I am venting and I'm just telling him, man, like, I don't know if this is ever going to work. And he's like, come on, man, don't you have any other interviews lined up? And I'm like, no, man, I got nothing. And he's like, come on, like, you you know, you got to pick your spirits back up. And I'm like, dude, even if I had an interview, I'd probably mess that up too. You know, look what happened with Buffett, you know? I, not only do I not have an interview, I don't even know how to interview. And as we're talking about this, talking about how hard it is to interview, this car pulls up and parks right in front of us in the loading zone. The door swings open, and it's you know one of the most miraculous coincidences of my life. The door swings open and out walks Larry King. And I don't know if you can relate to this, but sometimes in the most opportune moments in life is when I freeze up the most. You know, my mouth gets wired shut, my throat tightens, and Larry King walks right past us into the grocery store, sliding doors and disappears. 
my friend Corwin, you know, thank God he was there. He like jabs his elbow into me and is like, dude, what the hell? Why didn't you say something? And I'm just like, I don't know, man. You know, the great thing about fear is it has this uncanny ability to mask itself as logic. So I, you know, I'm coming up with all these logical reasons of why it was best not to talk to him. And Corwin's like, dude, come on. You have to at least go say something. And I'm like, I don't know, man, he's gone. He's probably, you know, far, you know, far away at this point. And he's like, dude, he's 80 years old. How far could he have gotten? (laughs) So very reluctantly, I stand up and I walk into the grocery store to look for Larry. And I look around the bakery in the front and he's not there. So I, you know, jog over to the produce section. You know, there's the fruits, there's the vegetables. No Larry. And right then is when I remembered he had parked in the loading zone, so he must be leaving any second now. So this boost of adrenaline kicks in, and I start sprinting through the grocery store down every aisle. No Larry, no Larry, no Larry, no Larry, no Larry. I cut a left speed down the frozen food section. I'm dodging old ladies. I <laughs> still no Larry. So he has to be at the checkout counter. So I run to every checkout counter. No Larry, no Larry, no Larry, no Larry, no Larry. And that's when, you know, I just want to kick myself because he had been right in front of me and I didn't say a thing. So I'm just, you know, walking out of the grocery store through the parking lot, staring down at my feet And I finally lift my gaze and right there, 20 feet in front of me is Larry King, suspenders and all. (laughs) And I don't know what gets into me, but in my stomach, I just feel almost this eruption and I start yelling at the top of my lungs, Mr. King. (laughs) And, you know, the echo just reverberates in the parking lot and everyone spins their head around. And, you know, poor Larry, the guy's had quadruple bypass surgery. I'll never forget his shoulders jumping like a a foot in the air and his head turning around slowly. Every wrinkle on his face sprung back, his eyes open, looking at me like I'm the Grim Reaper. And he just, you know, speeds away. And, you know, I've dug myself into too big of a hole at this point. So I just like run after him and I'm like, Mr. King, Mr. King, I'm Alex. I'm 19 years old. I've always wanted to say hi. And he goes, okay, hi. And just keeps speeding away. (laughs) Sounds just like him too. (laughs) Exactly. So he's, he's going to his, um, he's going to his car and I'm just following him. He opens up the trunk, stuffs his groceries in. And right then I go, wait, Mr. King, can I go to breakfast with you? And he looks at me like I'm a lunatic. And before he responds, he ends up looking around and sees that on the sidewalk, about 10 people are watching this go down. So I guess out of like peer pressure or kindness, he just shrugs his shoulders and goes, okay, okay, okay. And I'm like, oh my God, thank you so much. And, you know, he opens his car door, climbs inside. And then I go, wait, Mr. King, what time? And he just looks at me and slams the door shut. And now I'm like shouting through the through the glass, Mr. King, what time? And he looks at me and just turns on the car engine. I'm now standing like in front of the windshield, flailing my arms. Mr. King, what time? And he just looks at me and just mouths nine o'clock and just speeds off. <laughs> And I end up showing up you know, the next morning at his, I knew he like owned this bagel shop in Los Angeles. So I show up at his bagel shop at nine o'clock and there he is sitting in the corner booth and he's with all of his best friends and there's a seat open at the table, but you know, a day had passed and I had some time to reflect about how sort of crazy I had been the day before. So I decide, you know, let me just say hello from a distance and see if he invites me over. And I'm like, good morning, Mr. King. And he looks up at me and just goes, you know, just mumbles. So I'm like, okay, maybe he needs a few minutes. So I sit at the table next to him, waiting for him to call me over. 10 minutes pass. 30 minutes pass. An hour. And eventually he stands up. And he steps towards me. And I can feel my cheeks lifting. And then he walks right past me and heads for the exit. (gasps) 
<laughs> and I remember, you know, putting a, a hand in the air and I'm like, Mr. Mr. King. And he just turns around and he goes, what is a kid? What do you want? And I felt this very sharp, familiar pain in my chest. And I look at him and I'm like, honestly, I just wanted some advice on how to interview people. And this slow smile spreads across his face, almost as if to say, why didn't you just say so? And he puts a hand on my shoulder and gives me, you know, one of the best monologues of interview advice. And at the end of the monologue, he looks up as if he's debating something in his mind. And then he looks back down at me, puts a finger in my face and goes, all right, kid, tomorrow, 845, see you here. <laughs> and I show up the next morning and he calls me over to the table. He asks me why I'm so interested in interviewing. I tell him about the book. He goes, all right, I'm in. And oh, amazing. Over the course of the past five years, I've been to breakfast with him over 50 times. And you were just on his show. I, I mean, you did a full, he interviewed you for this book and wow. So when I got to this portion of the story, I was thinking, here you are in dire straits thinking this thing isn't working. And the universe serves up Larry King right in your pathway. If I were you, I would have thought, oh, there, there's no chance this book is not happening at this point. It is so – was that a moment for you where you're like, okay, someone else has my back here. This is this is a sure thing <laughs> because – No, I wish, I wish you were right. Maybe hopefully, you know, in hindsight, we were friends and you could have told me this because <laughs> at the time, when you're surrounded by 100 rejections yeah. and one miracle happens, the way the human brain works – you know, because we're we were evolved to survive and focus on the threats. All you think about are the things that are threatening you or rejecting you or hurting you. You for you don't focus on that one beautiful miracle. Yeah, I mean the fact that it was Larry King too, and you wanted to learn how to become a better inter. I mean that was what you felt you needed to do is learn how to ask these questions of these people. It's just. It leads me to my next question, and that is, was there any connective tissue or through line of all of these people that you've spoken with? I mean, Lady Gaga, Quincy Jones, the list goes on and on. In terms of faith or believing in something bigger than themselves. A friend of mine told me this great quote. She said, you know, you can go through life without faith. But the ones who do have faith have an unfair advantage. And I love that. And what I've learned is that whether it's faith, whether it's being you know connected to the universe, or at the very least, just having a higher purpose for your for your work, or it's more than just showing up at an office. It's not just the key, it's almost non-negotiable. Because what happens is that if you're trying to achieve your dream, and if it's a dream worth fighting for, you're going to be faced with setbacks. You're going to have doors slammed in your face. You're going to have rejections. There will be points where you seriously ask yourself, is this even possible? If you're not asking yourself that, you're not chasing a big enough dream. And the only thing that keeps you going, when all the logical facts tell you this isn't going to work out, is that higher belief. And that's a that's a trend you've seen with with yeah, these people. You know absolutely. that to be true. I can I can feel it the way you're saying it. Absolutely, I I subscribe 100 percent to and speaking with a lot of similar caliber people. It's and I've also heard you say another consistency is their kindness, which some people might be surprised by. I am not, but I hope that that feels good for people to hear that because most, a lot of people will never meet these individuals, but to hear from you that that was a, a trend is I think really, really valuable. Thank yeah. you. I, I agree a hundred percent. So I just have one more question and then a few rapid fire questions. 
I saw an article that you did way back. I think it was TechCrunch, or I'm not sure what it was for, but it was before the book came out. I think you were midway through this process, and you talked about modesty versus humility. And I know you've you've talked a bit about this. But then after reading that article and your viewpoint on it, which I really want you to share because it's I thought it was a an aha for me because there is a big difference. The way you described it is great. But you also wrote in your book after you know the section with Pitbull. You talk about the fact that if you want to continue being Mufasa at the same time, you have to keep being Simba. And that kind of goes back to something you said earlier about being naive and, and a beginner. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about this topic of modesty versus humility? Maya Angelou is really the one who showed me the way on this. And interviewing her was one of the you know really great honors of my life and, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful chapters in the book. And something Maya Angelou talks about a lot is the difference between modesty and humility. Modesty is, you know, someone saying, oh, little old me, no, 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 I'm I'm not that special. If someone's like, oh, you you know, you're such a great piano player going up there, oh, me, I don't know, no, no, no. That's modesty. That's a facade of meekness in a very calculated approach to try to get people to like you. That's modesty. Humility, on the other hand, comes from within. Humility is knowing that everything you've done in your life is only possible because of the people who came before you and laid those tracks down. Humility is understanding that everything that you're doing is thanks to the sacrifices of those who came before you. So while modesty is this facade of meekness externally, humility comes from very, very deep within. So while you should never strive to be modest, you always need to stay humble. And there's a critical difference. And I think it's one of the most important things in the world. Mm, Thank you for sharing that. I do too. I definitely do too. A few rapid fire questions for you, but actually they don't have to be that rapid if you don't want. <laughs> I like it. Let's do it. <laughs> you choose the pace, right? Okay. What's one lesson that you've had to learn over and over? You find yourself repeating that lesson. Oh my God. All of them. Um, <laughs> um, the thing that I have to keep reminding myself over and over and over again is... I am enough. And the reason I have to keep reminding myself that is because the inverse, my feelings of being not enough, not worthy, not lovable, um, are really the core of my insecurities. And it's those insecurities, you know, almost every bad decision you've made in your life, if you keep pulling back the layers enough, it was because of an insecurity. And that insecurity is because of this you know, really crazy idea that got implanted into your head as a story, as a child that you never have been able to let go of. So it's something even now I have to keep, you know, on a weekly, sometimes even daily basis, you know, just gently remind myself of. And every time I just gently remind myself, it releases its grip a bit more. Wow. That's so good. So good. I was recently asked something that I usually ask, and that is, what advice would you give to your younger self? And my answer was, you are enough. So that's an interesting parallel. And just it seems like when we press from a place of having something to prove, the outcome is so different when we're pushing from a place of purpose. And wow, love that. Okay, so... If we take away the titles, we take away the author, speaker, person who has interviewed all these fancy people, who are you? Mm, Oh, great question. I've never had to think about that. First things that came to my mind, brother, son, best friend. Mm, Good, good. All-time favorite book? 
Mm, oh my god. Oh. oh my god. It depends what mood I'm in, but if I had to take one on a desert island and I couldn't take another one, it would have to be Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Really? That's awesome. Now, okay, this is the thing I need. I Please give me a minute to stand on this soapbox. This is very important to me. <laughs> you got it. Stand, stand. Anyone listening here, I think about this every day. You know, kids obviously like Harry Potter. Okay, blah, blah, blah. I did not read Harry Potter as a kid. I read it as an adult in my 20s after going on this, you know, journey of writing this book. And with that lens, I actually think Harry Potter is even better and more important of a book than if you read it as a kid. And I'll tell you why. Harry Potter on the outside is, yeah, you know, blah, 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 this book about magic and wizards. Okay, that is not what the book is about. That's just the context and the setting. Harry Potter is the most important book about courage, friendship, family, death, and love. And there's nothing more important in life than those five things. You know, not only is it one of the most entertaining books ever written, you know, the sales numbers prove that. In my opinion, there's no more important lessons than those lessons. And if you're interested in those five things, you need to read the whole series because not only is it fun and enthralling, the lessons are much more valuable if you read it as an adult than if you read it as a kid. Oh, now I have to read it. I, I'm afraid to admit I haven't because I've I've kind of judged it by its cover and surface. But now, thank you. So what are you reading right now? Mm. I'm currently reading uh, two books. One is... When Things Fall Apart by Pema Chodron, which I cannot recommend higher. And another book is on grief and grieving. And what keeps you up at night? Uh, a lot of things. Recently. <laughs> um, my family. And just making sure that they're okay. Mm. Pirates or ninjas? Who is tougher and why? Ooh. You know... It depends where they're fighting. If they're out on the ocean, the pirates win. If they're on land, the ninjas win. Mm, nice rationale there. Thank you for backing that up. And a final question. What advice would you give to your younger self? It's going to be okay. You can relax. But my younger self would have said, you don't know anything. <laughs> I would have kept, you know, going 100 miles an hour. It, totally right. We we wouldn't have probably listened, but you know, there may be someone listening right now that would that's going to resonate with. It just this has just been a true joy to connect with you. And as as I'm reading, I have all these questions, and I'm like the best job in the world. I get to actually ask them to the author. So this is been enlightening and I really, really appreciate it. And I just, I'm just proud of you. I'm cheering for you and I'm excited to see oh, what you. you do next and where this goes. And yeah, I feel like it's only just begun. I love that. Thank you so, so, so much. Hey everyone, thanks for listening to the show. Hit me up on social media to let me know what you think. I'm at Amy Jo Martin on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And I want to hear your why not now moments so I can share them on the show. Just send me a note to why not now at amyjomartin.com. For show notes and other offers, you can visit amyjomartin.com forward slash why not now. And while you're there, don't forget to sign up for my email newsletter for exclusive content and announcements. A big thanks to Rock Salt Music for all of the tunes by the talented John Coggins. And of course, a hat tip to Richard Gruer for editing and producing the show. I'll see you next time. And until then, why not now? Mm -hmm.